Today I'm going to talk about worship in spirit and in truth. So turn your Bibles to John 4, 23 through 24. John 4, 23 to 24 says, says this, Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and the worshipers must worship in the spirit and in the truth. There's a lot going on there. Um, and a lot of times we'll just skim right through that verse, and we will read it and we'll think, hey, it's... I know exactly what that means. I'm going to worship God with all of my spirit, with everything that I have, with all of my heart, and, uh, and everything is going to be true. See, that's, that's kind of, you know, you skim through the verse, and that's what you get out of it. Like myself, at first glance, when I first read this, um, you, you would think that believing, you would think that you knew exactly what it, what it meant, that we must worship truthfully with all of our spirit. Well, let's dive deep into that today. We're actually going to dive deep. We're going to do an exegesis on this passage, and we're going to see what it really means to worship in the Spirit and in truth. So number one, worship God in spirit. What does that mean? Worship God in the Spirit. Well, if you really break down that word spirit, it's actually a noun. Okay, it's not the verb. It's not the verb form, ruah. It's a noun. Numa, which is the Holy Spirit. So the word is actually talking about the Holy Spirit, not your spirit, not the spirit that is breathed into you. It's talking about the Holy Spirit, the noun form, the actual person, the third person in the Trinity. It's talking about the Holy Spirit. So I love the way this verse, I've never read this translation. Some of you guys may know it, but I, I, I found this translation on contemporary English version. Have you guys heard of that on the CEV? C-E-V, I love the way they put it. I'm going to read this verse in the C-E-V. But a time is coming, and it is already here. Even now the true worshipers are being led by the Spirit, the Numa, the Holy Spirit, to worship the Father according to the truth. I'll say that again. Even now the true worshipers are being led by the Holy Spirit, led by the Holy Spirit, to worship the Father according to the truth. You get that? Led by the Holy Spirit. Our worship has to be led by the Holy Spirit. These are the ones the Father is seeking to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship God must be led by the Holy Spirit to worship him according to the truth. So, you cannot worship God without the Holy Spirit. Amen? In order to worship God, you have to have the Holy Spirit. That is right there in the word. You have to have the Holy Spirit in order to worship God. Now, some of you are saying, oh, that's, I'm, that's great. I, I've been saved. I've received the Holy Spirit. I've received Jesus Christ as my Savior. I've received the indwelling of the Holy Spirit when I was saved. True. You're saved. You received Jesus Christ. You received the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. So you're covered, right? So you think, yeah, you're great. So all of your worship, if you're saved, your worship is great. You're worshiping God the way that you're supposed to. That's what you would think. Well, technically you are covered as long as you allow the Holy Spirit to work and you do not resist the Holy Spirit. So you got to dig deep in the Word of God and see what, what you know, what, you know where, where can you find these things. So Stephen, the first martyr, speaks to a hostile audience. In Acts 7.1, 7.51, he says, you stubborn people, you are heathen, at heart and deaf to the truth. Must you forever resist the Holy Spirit? That's what your ancestors did, and so do you. So we have the ability to resist the Holy Spirit. That's not a good thing, but we have the ability to resist the Holy Spirit. So let's, let's dig a little bit. How can, what does that mean? So how do you allow the Holy Spirit to work? I'm going to give you um, a few different passages, and we're just going to go uh, line by line in these passages, and, um, and we'll talk about them. So how to allow the Holy Spirit to work. Right in the middle of all these instructions that we're going to give right here, 
we'll find the command that God is giving to all of us. Number one, um, go to 1 Thessalonians 5.19. So we have this ability to resist the Holy Spirit, which is not good. A lot of times we'll think that, you know, there's no way we can resist the Holy Spirit. God is God. He is all powerful. He is almighty. The Holy Spirit is always there. But we have this ability to resist, and it tells it right here. 1 Thessalonians 5.19 says, do not quench the Spirit. And we see this all in the Word of God. He says, do not quench the Spirit. Do not um, stifle, is in another translation, do not stifle or choke the Holy Spirit. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.16. So we're, now we're going to go through ways of, um, we're going to break this down and uh, see what we need to do in order to not quench the Holy Spirit. These are some things that maybe some of you do, and you're not realizing that you're actually putting the Holy Spirit away. You're, you're, you're not allowing the Holy Spirit to work in your life because of some of these things that we do. So number one, uh, A, in verse 16, it says to rejoice always. Rejoice always. It doesn't say rejoice sometimes. It doesn't say to rejoice when all is well and all is good. It doesn't say to rejoice when you're financially stable or rejoice when you're healthy. It says to rejoice always. So if you're not rejoicing, you're not allowing the Holy Spirit to work in your life. And you're not worshiping God. Verse 17 says to pray continually. It says to pray continually. So this is an internal thing. This doesn't mean you're out there praying all day long, oh, God, thank you, Jesus. For You can, by all means. You absolutely can be praying out loud. But it's the Holy Spirit doing the prayer in you, doing the prayer for you. Pray continually. It doesn't say, again, it doesn't say pray sometimes. It doesn't say pray when you're in hard times. It doesn't say pray when things are just horrible. It doesn't say pray when you need healing. It says pray continually. So again, if you're not praying, you're not worshiping. You guys see the correlation here? Yeah. Number 18, give thanks in all circumstances. Same thing. In whatever situation you are in, give thanks to the Lord. Well, how can I give thanks to God for what I'm going through right now? Maybe he's setting you up for something later on. Maybe he's going to use you as, as a testimony to somebody else later on. Give thanks to the Lord in every single situation, whether bad or good. Sometimes, when all is great, we don't give thanks to the Lord for it. We talk a lot about the bad situations when, when we need help, but we forget that when things are going well in our life, we still need to give thanks to God for that. You know, it's because of God that things are going well in your life. It's because of God that you are healed. It's because of God that you have financial stability. It is not by our own power. It is by the grace of God. So always give thanks in every single circumstance. Verse 20, do not treat prophecies with contempt. Do not treat prophecies with contempt. Who here has been prophesied over at one point in their life? Who here has yet to see that prophecy come to fruition? Do not treat that prophecy with contempt. Hold on to it. Because if it is a true prophecy, and if it is what the Lord wants for you, then it will happen. So do not treat it with contempt. It goes on to say in verse 21, but test them all. Test those prophecies. See, sometimes we receive a prophetic word, and, you know, it, if, if, it, it usually it's, of God, but the Lord still wants us to go to him and see if that prophetic word is actually what he wants for us. I made that mistake years ago, 10, 12 years ago. No, longer, longer, like 15 years ago when I first um, got married, I received a prophetic word, and I held on to that prophetic word without testing it. And, right, and a few years ago, I realized, wait a minute, this wasn't a valid word. The Lord told me, don't hold on to that word because it's keeping you from receiving your true blessing. So test the word. Even if you know that it's coming from somebody you know and trust, that knows the Lord, somebody that has a prophetic gift, test the word. The Bible tells us to test that word. 
Verse 22 says to reject every kind of evil. I don't know what evil looks like in your life. I don't know what you consider evil, but I guarantee that you know what you consider evil. And I guarantee that some of the things that we do, we ourselves consider evil. So reject that evil. Reject it. Let it go. Because if you're still holding on to it, you are not worshiping God. Amen? Um, the second verse that we're going to go to is Ephesians 4.30. Second passage. Do not bring sorrow to the Holy Spirit. So we can bring, now we can bring sorrow to the Holy Spirit. Yeah, we think that the Holy Spirit is all great, that he's going to be always joyful, but we can actually bring sorrow to the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 4.30 says, and do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. Key words there is by the way you live. Verse 22 says, throw off your old sinful nature and your formal way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. So if you've been saved, if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, don't turn back to your old ways. You are a new creation in Christ Jesus. Do not revert back to your old ways. Because if you do, you are not worshiping Christ. Verse 23 Instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Let the Holy Spirit work in you. Go to him every day and let him renew your thoughts and your attitudes every day, every moment. Verse 24, put on your new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. See, when you accepted Jesus Christ, you received the ultimate example of the way to live. You know, Jesus Christ, the ultimate example of how we should live our lives. So put on that new nature. Do what he did. Honestly, do what Jesus did. And don't be ashamed of it. Put on the new nature. You were created to be like God. You were created to be like Jesus, truly righteous and holy. Number 25, very basic. Stop telling lies. <laughs> If you're lying, you are not worshiping God. I cannot put it any more plainly. If you're lying, you're not worshiping God. Stop telling lies. Number 26, and don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. Don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't sin when you're angry. Uh, we can be angry. We can be upset. But don't let that turn into sin. Uh, verse 28, if you are a thief, quit stealing. I don't think anybody steals in here. I don't know. I don't know your personal lives. I don't think anybody steals in here. I'm just going to assume everybody is great, that we don't have any thieves in here. All is great. But I love this second part of it. Instead, use your hands for good work, good hard work, and then give generously to others in need. Use your hands for good hard work. God created your hands for good. He didn't create these hands just to remain still and do nothing with. He created these hands so he can use them to advance the kingdom of God. So use your hands for good hard work. 29, don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be, encouraged, will be an encouragement to those who hear them. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that you can encourage others. Watch what you say. I mean, this is really basic stuff. I, at least I, I think it is. It seems like it. But it's so profound when you incorporate worship into this. When you realize that if you're doing any of these, of the, of these things, you're not worshiping God. It takes it to a whole new level. So don't use foul or abusive language. Number uh, 31, verse 31. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Self-explanatory. Verse 32, instead, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. Forgiving one another, just as God 
through Christ has forgiven you. We have to forgive each other. We have to forgive one another. Don't hold on to grudges. Forgive the offenses that are made against you. Forgive one another. Because if you're not, you're not worshiping God. Let's put that into perspective. If you have not forgiven somebody, you're not worshiping God. So who do you hold offense to? Let it go so you can worship God. Amen? And Ephesians 5.18 says, Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Because we can fill ourselves with other things. We can fill ourselves with the things of this world. The Holy Spirit resides in us, but we can still fill ourselves with other things. So instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Verse 15 says, so be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. Are you living foolishly? Because if you are, you're not worshiping God. I don't know what foolishness looks like in your life, but you do. So think about it. If you're living foolishly, you're not worshiping God. Number 16, make the most of, or verse 16, make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Do not let an opportunity go to waste. When the Lord presents you with something, when the Lord presents you with a task, um, or when he gives you somebody to pray over, whatever it is, do not let that opportunity go to waste. Make the most of it. Verse 17, don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. So walk knowing that the Lord is in control of your life. He knows exactly what he has in store for you. So just follow him. Number 19. Verse 19. This is a cool one because it applies to our worship as song. Singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves and making music to the Lord in your hearts. So this is where we see that worship as as music, where we can worship God with our music, where we can worship God with our our voice, our vocals. Um, It says here clearly to sing psalms and hymns, sing songs to the Lord and making music to the Lord in your heart. So, yes, sing to the Lord. When we're worshiping here before service, before the word, sing. Open up your mouth. Sing to the Lord. I hate to say it, but it's what the word says. If you're not, you're not worshiping God. Open your mouth and worship the Lord. That can be a little hard for some of us because we get intimidated by the amazing singers that we have up here. But but guys, I'm a horrible singer. And you hear me up here just yelling. And you know what? I'm okay with it because it's between me and God. You know, nobody's watching you. Nobody's judging you. Nobody's going to leave here and say, oh man, that person did not know how to sing. That was awful. Nobody's going to do that. And if they do, they're not worshiping God because. (laughs) So worship God with your song. Don't be afraid to sing to the Lord. Uh, what was that? That was 19. Verse 20, and give thanks for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Give thanks, again, give thanks to the Lord for everything. Verse 21, and further, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Submit to one another. Help one another. Talk with one another. Serve one another. Because if you're not, and you're just here, own, all by yourself, on your own lonesome self, you're not worshiping God. Submit to one another. So those are the things that we have to do in order to worship God in the Spirit. Because we just learned that, well, we can not worship God in the Spirit. And if we're not doing that, it's not true worship to God. The second part of of this is uh, worship God in truth. That's a whole lot easier to explain. Are you guys getting something out of this? All right, good, good. Are you guys feeling like you need to worship God in, in the Spirit? Feeling like you can worship God in the Spirit now? All right, now we're going to worship God in the truth. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Nope, that's not it, wrong one. Worship God in the truth. 
When we worship in truth, we don't worship empty philosophies that come from the world's way of thinking. Instead, we focus on the message and the truth of Jesus Christ. The word of God is the truth. Okay, Jesus is the truth. So when it says worship God in truth, you're worshiping Jesus, you're worshiping the word of God. Colossians 2.6 says, And now, just as you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord, you must continue to follow him. Let your roots grow down into him and let your lives be built on him. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth that you were taught. And we and you will overflow with thankfulness. Don't let anyone capture you with empty philosophies and high-sounding nonsense that come from the human thinking and from the spiritual powers of this world rather than Christ. So are you worshiping in truth? Are you worshiping Jesus Christ? Are you worshiping the word of God? Or are you allowing this world to dictate what you worship? Worshiping in truth also means to be true about your circumstances. Don't hide it from God. I mean, he sees it. He sees what you're going through. He knows exactly what is going on in your lives. Don't hide it from him. Be true about your circumstances. If you need help with something, if you need um, healing, be honest about it. If you need to be freed from sin, be honest about it. Be honest about your struggles, your temptations. Be honest about your sins. These are three things that came to me. The three R's, I'll call them. True worship includes recognizing, repentance, and release. Number one, recognizing. Recognizing that you don't have it all together. As we are not in control of our own lives. We do not have it all together. And if you think you do, you're not worshiping God. You are certainly worshiping yourself. You do not have it all together. Recognize that you need help. You cannot do this alone. You cannot. Jesus had 12 disciples. It wasn't just Jesus. You cannot walk this walk alone. Recognize that you can't do it on your own. Recognize that he is greater. Recognize that Jesus is greater than any situation, any circumstance, any issue that you are in. Recognize that he is greater, that he has the power to conquer it, that you have the power through Jesus Christ to overcome that obstacle. Recognize that he is greater. And when you do that, that's true worship to God. The second part was repentance. And I'm not going to take credit for this section here, but I got this from gotquestions.org. I love the way they worded it here. Repentance. True repentance involves a sense of awareness of one's own guilt, sinfulness, and helplessness. Are you aware? Be aware of what you're going through. Be aware of what you need to repent from. True repentance apprehends or takes hold of God's mercy in Jesus Christ. True repentance means a change of attitude and action regarding sin. How many of you have truly repented, truly repented, and gone back to what you repented from. If you have, I have to show, you don't have to raise your hand. <laughs> if you have, that wasn't true repentance. True repentance means a change of attitude and actions regarding sin. Do you really mean it? Do you really honestly want to let go of what it is that's holding you back? Or is it just too good that you can't let it go? True repentance. True repentance. Hatred of sin turns the repent, repentant person away from his or her sin to God. So you have to hate that sin. Do you hate that sin? You have to hate that sin. True repentance, repentance results in a radical and persistent pursuit of holy living walking with God in obedience to his commands. And so you've repented. Are you living holy? True repentance results in radical pursuit of holy living. Amen? 
And the third part, release. We must commit to never repeat that act, regardless of the temptations or situation. You have to release whatever it is. You have to release that sin. You have to release whatever you just repented from. That is true worship. True worship involves recognizing, it involves repentance, and it involves releasing that action. In closing, you cannot worship God only in spirit or only in truth. That's, that's not what it says here. It says worship God in spirit and in truth. Worship God in the spirit and in truth. You need to worship in the spirit. You need to worship in both. You need to worship in spirit. You need to worship with the Holy Spirit with an understanding that the Holy Spirit is in control of your life and that everything that we talked about earlier, you have all of that in alignment. You're, you're doing good. You're joyful. You are uh, celebrating God in every situation. You are uh, being a kind person. You need to have all of those in order in order to truly uh, worship God. Um, I th- think once we understand, I, this is where I want to talk a little bit about uh, revival and what Sammy was talking about. Once we have these things in order, once we learn how to truly worship God, once we learn that what he's saying about um, in the spirit and in truth, once we learn what that actually means and we're living it, that's when we'll see revival. Guys, revival is not something that is going to happen in this place. Revival is something that happens in your hearts, okay? And then when we get together, we celebrate that revival, okay? So if you're not living for Christ, if you're not worshiping God, then you cannot expect revival. You have to have that revival in your own personal life, okay? That's when we're going to see revival. Um, That means letting go of the things that are hindering you. That means letting go of the nonsense of the garbage of the, who knows, the things you watch on TV. It means letting go of of, of the things that we spend the most time doing. Letting go of of what distracts us from God. It means clearing your schedule, clearing your calendars, and focusing on the Lord and truly realizing what it is that you want in this life. You know, because we're just passing through. We're just passing through on this earth. We're not living in it. We're not of this world. We're passing through. But sometimes we get stuck in that, that we are of this world because there's so much noise out there. Because there's so many distractions out there. And we get stuck in that realm where we are living, where we are of this world. But The Bible says we're just passing through. We're sojourners. We're just passing through. Right now, so many Christians worship God with only the remainders, with only what they have left. That's not what God wants. They worship God with only a few of these items in order or all of these in order on Sundays, just on Sundays, temporarily. But then come Monday, or come the moment we leave Freedom Church, or whatever church is out there, whatever, what, come the moment you leave your church, you're right back to where you were. That's not true worship. You're right back to being in this world. So in order to worship God, we must not resist the Holy Spirit at work in our lives. God, the, whole, the Holy Spirit is working in your life. And each and every one of you, if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, the Holy Spirit is working in your life. He's got a plan for you. He truly has a plan for you. Are you going to accept that plan? Are you going to walk with him and allow him to do his work? Or are you going to resist him? What's more important in your life, serving the Lord or serving this world? We must understand that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He has not and will not change. So just because we see changes happening in this world, it doesn't mean God is going to change. It doesn't mean God is going to change who he is so so we can get closer to him. God doesn't change. Jesus is just as much alive today as he was 2,000 years ago when he walked physically on this earth. He's still here. 
He is still here working in all of us. You need to recognize that and worship, truly understand what it is or who it is that you worship.